year. Last week, President Obama announced that he would send thousands of soldiers to West Africa. And it's established, or it's estimated, that one billion dollars is probably needed. More than 4,000 cases and 2,000 deaths, uh, and all these are only the confirmed numbers already from last week. So all this comes from Ebola, which currently has its largest outbreak to date. This is the first edition of this year's Better Break. Better Break is a monthly student-led discussion forum at the intersection of science and society here at Science Park Amsterdam. Today, three guests can tell us all about the medical details um, and the approaches to public health and the societal impact of the current outbreak. My name is Ramon Krijgton and my co-host is Duifje van Egmond and she will introduce our guests. How did I experience the past few months? Yes, I mean, you, you must have read yeah. A lot in yeah, well, there has been a lot of media coverage <coughs> on uh, on Ebola during the past months, and I, I, I started to compare that with all the coverage during 1995, when there was a first well, huge outbreak in uh, Congo, and at that time there was a lot of uh, very alarming uh, uh, media coverage. And compared to now, I see that it's now more, uh, let's say, uh, reassuring and more in the direction of, well, this can be contained in Africa and doesn't form a threat to us in the West. And that, that uh, gives another perspective to the media coverage than uh, was the case during 1995. Well, for me, it's uh, more a déjà vu because I'm keeping myself busy with viral hemorrhagic fever since the mid-90s, since I started working as a doctor, because matter of factly, as a specialist in tropical diseases, we always, we always have to think of the possibility that somebody who presents with fever coming back from the tropics has a viral hemorrhagic fever, but of course, given the dimension of this problem in relation to others, um, usually this is not the case. But I've witnessed several outbreak situations and was involved in, in the care for patients with suspected or real viral hemorrhagic fever. So for me, it's a déjà vu, but uh, I'm witnessing it for the first time in the Netherlands, but it's not which is dissimilar to what I've seen before. The, the dimension is different, of course, and um, yeah, my position is different. As head of tropical medicine here in Amsterdam, um, we have, of course, other possibilities to react. We use this outbreak in a way also to, to draw the attention to the other problems which we have in Africa, which should not be and must not be forgotten about this outbreak. Well, I mean, the point is simply we are now uh, drawn towards this uh, terrible outbreak, which is also beyond all expectation, expectations because the pattern has changed so far. All 24 outbreaks which we witnessed since 1976 took place in remote villages in the Central African rainforest. This is also where I encountered them before. But now Ebola has hit the big city, so the 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 nature of the play actually has, of the game has completely changed, so this is new, yeah. And at the RSA, are you taking uh, measures for uh, yeah. 
Sure. Well, at, first of all, as I said, as tropical medicine specialists, we always have to think of it, but usually we can sort these things out quietly because the chance that we are encountering a real viral hemorrhagic fever patients are, in the end, fairly low. Yeah? And this has not dramatically changed, at least not from the Netherlands. But of course, we do have our guidelines, we have reviewed the guidelines, we have used the opportunity also to sensitize um, our uh, fellow workers in the hospital um, that there may be a possibility that we will encounter a patient actually and we of course use this to um, yeah, to train the necessary steps in case we are confronted with a patient. And matter of factly, we are on a daily basis, but you are not realizing it because we are not every time, we are certainly not calling the press and tell them, ha, we have another suspect case. But the suspicion, the level of suspicion is usually as such that we can resolve this problem even before the patient even arrives at the hospital. So uh, <clears throat> for the last two months, uh, I, I work in an emergency room in Paris uh, in uh, Avicenne Ho University Hospital, which is uh, uh, between central Paris and the airport, and, uh, and also uh, with colleagues at Bichat Hospital, which is in the same area. Um, needless to tell you, there's a very large uh, population of people who travel back and forth to West Africa, in, in particularly in that part of Paris. So we also are confronted uh, actually on a daily basis to what we call uh, s not suspected cases, but where there's a, we have to rule out that they're, they're, the patients have been exposed to other Ebola cases. There's a whole kind of hierarchy. Uh, so, uh, one of the things the Paris Publis, Public Hospitals Authority, the uh, Assistance Publique, uh, has been doing is drills. I don't know if you've been doing them here where yeah. you practice, you know, what if a patient arrives and putting on the gloves and, and all this kind of business. But uh, last week we, um, we uh, received a patient, a 17-year-old girl who had just arrived from uh, earlier in the day from a flight from West Africa who had uh, 40 degrees of fever and uh, was confused. And she um, so was brought very quickly into the emergency room and uh, literally uh, had a cardiac arrest uh, within five minutes of arriving. And so we had to resuscitate her and she was bleeding and so on. It wasn't a case of Ebola, it was a case of cerebral uh, malaria. But it shows that uh, even when you prepare, you can't prepare for every eventuality. So I'm not trying to be scary here at all. I, I, I agree that there are very little chances that uh, uncontrolled Ebola will come, but I think we also need to know that, you know, much of the media coverage, I, I think we could discuss this, has been about how this is a surprise and we, ha we haven't been prepared for this. In fact, we spent billions of dollars preparing for this since uh, September 11th. A lot of money has gone to bioterrorism and Ebola and so on, and yet we're still unprepared. And I think this is one of the paradoxes uh, of this epidemic. Okay, yeah, we will discuss that later with the three of you. Uh, but first, I want to uh, get some facts about what Ebola yeah. actually is and where it comes from. Um, this is Dr. Vidal, something like that. Okay, thank you. Ebola is a viral disease. And Ebola belongs to the group of diseases which we call viral hemorrhagic fevers. Now, of course, um, this disease can very difficultly be differentiated from other diseases we are confronted with when we see patients coming from the tropics. For example, it's no wonder that uh, this girl whom you saw from West Africa qualified in some way for the diagnosis, but of course with fever, with being drowsy, confused, with having maybe headaches, headaches muscle pain, feeling miserable, um, this is precisely what the symptoms of Ebola and all the other viral hemorrhagic fevers are in the beginning. We Marburg, by for, for example, is the same, Lassa fever, etc. The problem is, this is completely identical with at least 20 diseases, which I could name to you. Malaria, for example, yeah, typhoid fever, bacterial diseases of any kind, even a flu, 
may present with the same symptoms. However, the characteristics of the biomyometric fevers is that if you are not only infected, we also know that with highly deadly diseases like those, there is also the possibility that you get infected without falling ill, actually. And, um, but let's say you are infected, you are falling ill, then it takes between two days and a maximum of three weeks, but usually this is rapidly evolving. It takes two to seven days on average that you develop symptoms, you fall ill, and after one or two days, you may progress to a complex disease where you go into organ failure, where liver function, renal function uh, become worse, and where there is a tendency to bleed. However, during this outbreak, this one is not characterized through frank bleedings, which is also known. Most of the patients who succumb to Ebola, they don't develop any serious bleedings, which is also one of the difficulty in differentiating it from others. And preferably at the end of each block. So if three blocks and we are discussing Ebola now and at the end of the block you're most welcome to come and ask a question. Um, but uh, I was wondering, you're telling, like, it's hard to see, but isn't there any, any antibody test that people can use to see if well, 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 this is something different. You ask me about the symptoms, but of course there are specific tests to figure out whether we deal with Ebola or not. The only problem with these tests is as well, what you do not wish is that an Ebola patient or somebody who is really, really having a high suspicion of having Ebola or another disease which is easily transmitted through contact with blood, through contact with uh, bodily fluids actually, uh, you cannot process those in a standard lab. This is basically the difficulty, but there are good diagnostic tools which can in those specialized laboratories, we have one in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam, but usually the most established in Europe is uh, at the Bernard Nocht Institute in Hamburg, actually a very sophisticated viral diseases unit. And within 24 hours, we are able to obtain a, a, a specific diagnosis. So saying, it's, it's possible, it's just not possible. The diagnosis, the, to establish the diagnosis once you have the suspicion and you do the right laboratory tests at the right place is not a problem. However, what is problematic is to filter out those patients who really do have Ebola from all the patients who present at a given point in time with fever. For example, in West Africa, this also triggered this outbreak, of course, we are discussing Ebola. It reaches a scary scale, an unprecedented scale in West Africa. But at the same time point, even in the hotbeds of the infection, in some of the smaller towns and cities in Guinea, in Liberia, more people are dying at the same time or coming down from malaria, from tuberculosis, from HIV-related problems, actually. And to tell those who really have Ebola, apart from those who don't, right at the beginning is very, very difficult. Yeah, so, but we, uh, I understand that you all uh, know a lot about Ebola for years, but I think me and uh, a lot of people here never really heard of it. Like, where did, where did this outbreak come from? Like, how did it start? Is there a way to tell it? Uh, well, my, my colleague on the right is probably more knowledgeable about this, but my understanding is that uh, a, there was an index case, uh, patient zero, who was probably infected uh, by a transmission from a bat. Uh, so it's a, what we call a zoonosis. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. It's a zoonosis, so it's a virus which comes from an animal reservoir, as most human infectious diseases do. Um, and uh, sporadic outbreaks occur when these uh, animal-to-human transmissions occur either through consumption of fruit contaminated by bat saliva or, uh, or bat feces or uh, through uh, exposure to bodily fluids of um, monkeys through butchering. Just a very interesting little mathematical biological fact. One of the reasons bats are reservoirs is that they're the only mammal other than humans who live in very large population concentrations. The bats live in huge colonies. So they're kind of, just like humans are, they're kind of um, 
culture media for viruses. And I just wanted to add what my colleague said. This is a really, really important point. We, we can devise rapid antibody tests to detect antibodies, but people with Ebola are either dead or cured, most of them, by the time they have antibodies. So we have to actually do PCR to detect viral uh, genetic uh, material, which is a much more uh, difficult uh, technically what test. What is PCR exactly? Polymerase chain reaction. So it's where you... Uh, basically look for specific sequences of RNA and then amplify them using molecular techniques. So you have to find the signal and amplify it. So it requires very uh, uh, much more t technology to do that. The turnaround time for a PCR is, uh, uh, we've got it down now to about four hours uh, in, in France. Um, so you can, but you know, most places need about 24 hours, tw at least 12 hours to get the test back. So just imagine you have someone, a patient who has a fever who you think might have Ebola because they've been exposed. I mean, the classic case would be you're working in an emergency room in Amsterdam and someone arrives from a country which, where there's the epidemic. You ask them if they've been exposed to other people who are sick. Have they cared for family members who've been sick? You don't know whether those family members have Ebola or not. They could have just had malaria. But you have to place them in the suspect cases, and then you have to rule out Ebola. So you have to isolate them, and you have to wait for this test to come back. And you have to put them in the same place as all the other people who may or may not have Ebola are also being ruled out. And then if they come positive, then you move them into the confirmed cases ward. So it's a very complicated story with, and very dangerous for caregivers and other patients who may not have Ebola. How easily does it spread actually in these rooms or what is exactly the, the transmission rate? Yeah. Maybe we sh start by revisiting this interesting interface between the animal world and us. Where mm -hmm. do we get mm -hmm. it from? So during the 24 outbreaks which we witnessed since 1976, the disease was not transmitted by um, the definite host, which we didn't know until about three, four years ago, which is a bet actually. But um, all the cases or all the outbreaks which we witnessed were a classical zoonosis where the disease jumped from diseased animals to men. Usually what happened was that small groups of uh, hunters went deep into the Central African rainforest. They caught and slaughtered either antelopes or big, not apes in this case, not monkeys, but really apes, uh, chimpanzees, gorillas actually. And usually the usual story is that a gorilla uh, gets butchered, slaughtered, um, eaten actually, maybe half cooked, undercooked or so. Three, four, five of these hunters get infected. They venture back into their villages. They die from a febrile disease three, four days after, and then they are buried the traditional way, which involves intense body contact between the uh, family members next of kin with the disease, with the, with the deceased, actually. This is when the disease jumps from man to man and becomes a um, disease which is transmitted from man to man. Now, what we knew is that after two, three jumps from man to man, the virus loses some of its virulence, and usually these outbreaks naturally die out. Usually before a whole village is um, uh, succumbing to the infection. This is because the virus degenerates itself. Well, this it's is stable, what our theory was so far, and it seemed to hold true, because usually there was not an, a, a very high level of care which could be offered, and we know that toward the end of the outbreak, the survival rates are much higher than in the beginning, and then eventually these outbreaks died out. Now what has happened this time is, is that probably uh, the disease was for the first time transmitted directly from the infected bats and that can only happen in one way because differently from rabies for example where the bats become diseased themselves actually they are just viral carriers they don't become ill and usually the vampire bats, even the vampire bats, but in this case these are fruit bats actually, they don't bite men, they don't interact with us. In the places where we work in Central Africa, in Lambarene for example, one to two percent of the bats which are flying around our heads are infected with Ebola, yet the risk 
for us, getting infected is virtually nil because unless we start eating those fruit bats, um, nothing happens. And precisely that is what happened now in this big outbreak. Yeah. So somebody ate a bat and then... Yeah. But coming back to the transmissibility, the most important thing here is what... And this apparently has not altered, actually. And biologically, you would even need much bigger outbreaks, actually, if you want to witness a uh, massive viral antigen shift or drift so that, um, uh, let's say, the mode of transmission alters. What we know is that with direct contact with the virus through, as I said, blood feces, etc., uh, bodily fluids, actually, the risk of being infected and then getting ill is fairly high. However, there is no evidence so far from aerosolization. It's a fairly big virus, actually. And um, so it aerosolization, has I think you aerosolization that. means that if somebody vomits, coughs, etc., that the virus starts floating in the air, becoming transmissible, as we know from influenza, as we know from SARS, MERS, COVID, all these new scary um, emerging viral diseases, actually. Now, for Ebola, that doesn't seem to hold true. Although people start wondering because the infection rates are so excessive. So this could, this could never happen, this, uh, this mutation? No, 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 for sure, everything. I mean, the, the survival strategy of viruses is to heavily mutate. Our survival strategy is completely different. We do replicate maybe once or twice or thrice in our lives, and our biological strategy is to hand over our genetic information as precisely copied from the original as possible in order to avoid diseases, actually. Now, viruses and bacteria work completely different. They produce zillions of offspring because they live in very rapidly changing environments. Somebody may have the idea to throw antibiotics at their so, population, etc. So yeah. it is possible, but so probably we need a much bigger... Yeah. Mutations, everything is possible, of mm. course. The question is how likely is it? Yeah. And here, not only mutations play a role, but a phylovirus is quite a large beast, actually, if you compare it to others. Mm. So it can mutate as much as it wants. Mm. It, it will still be very difficult to okay. aerolo aerosolize yeah. because yeah. it's so big. It's yeah. thousands of times bigger yeah. than... Yeah, um, I think what I ask is because in the media, that's a very important point. Eh? Yeah. The, the, could there be a mutation which would lead to a sort of pandemic, to a virus that might kill millions of people all over the world? Uh, yeah. is, is there a possibility regarding the Ebola? You say that the possibility, the chances are very small, actually, but still this perspective is very important in the media. Could this yeah. be a threat to the developed world or not? Well, I had such a discussion, if I may add to this, I had lots of discussions like this along similar lines with journalists over the past couple of weeks. Also not about viral mutations, but about zillions of illegal immigrants um, coming through various canals into the Netherlands. Um, is that possible that we all die from virus like that? Of course, everything is possible. The question is how I told the journalists, one I told, well, maybe we don't reach the end of our conversation because we may be killed by a comet or a meteor, actually. But the chances are very small. And if you look at with regard to mutations, I think it's well possible. Yeah? Mm. They, um, the more people are infected, the higher the possibility that there are alterations to the virulence, yeah. etc. But here we must still think rational. And the phylovirus is so big mm. that it's simply, for me, it's not very likely okay. that it will yeah. ever become yeah. an aerosolized yeah. uh, yeah. agent, actually. Before we, before we go, uh, uh, talk more about of this disease. I would like to talk uh, a bit about uh, what COVID has done to the, to the countries that are affected. And I think maybe um, uh, Mr. Postman can tell us something about that. Like, uh, did, you, did you see the media that was spread there and is it very different from here? Like how, is, how are people reacting on the I didn't hear the last of your question. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, how do the media in these countries is reacting to this outbreak? Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, I can say a, a, a lot about the role of the media in this case because, uh, well, 
you have to uh, realize that the media don't just report facts about Ebola and about how many people died. The media give meaning. They frame this uh, virus and this whole outbreak in a certain narrative, in a certain story, which makes it interesting for the readers back home uh, or in, in the Netherlands or in the Western world. And of course, this Ebola outbreak uh, does not have any risks for uh, the Netherlands at, at this moment, as long as there is no mutation uh, going on. There is no risk. Uh, if you have, would have a patient, as you just said, in Holland, this would not pose any risk because this would be contained immediately. And uh, my theory, more or less, is also that this whole Ebola outbreak is more the consequence of a bad health structure and uh, of ignorance and superstition. Uh, than of a real threat of this virus becoming a sort of pandemic. Yeah. So what's happening in those societies then? Maybe both you and Mr. Nguyen could, can tell about it. What's happening to the government, to social unrest? Well, I, I think the point that, that's just been made is extremely important, which is that um, uh, weak health systems actually transmit the epidemic. If you're in a country like the Netherlands with a strong health system, uh, it will be able to very easily contain uh, any cases that arrive, even if there's a boatload of, you know, zombie migrants or something. You know, even our worst fantasies can't really come true here because there is an effective, there's a strong state, and there is a strong health system. Where you have no health system, where people don't seek care, you also cannot get much of an epidemic because people will not congregate. And what we've seen in West Africa is kind of a perfect storm of an urban, in, in Liberia, an urban epidemic, but an epidemic where, which is being spread uh, or being facilitated by the fact that people seek care, but they can't get it. So this is really the, the if you will, the criminal element in all of this, which is that for 30 years, uh, through structural adjustment and various other policies, we've been actually making it impossible for health systems to function properly. Now there's a, another... Do you think these are policies that made this situation? Yeah, I mean, since the 1980s, the world, there's, there's been a very systematic policy of you know, what we would call today austerity, uh, which is of cutbacks and of re reducing uh, the, um, <coughs> the uh, ability of the state to fund health, privatization of health care. We're familiar with this here. Um, so yes, and that argument has been made for about 15 years by journalists such as Laurie Garrett, who've said that this is going to lead to problems uh, such as we're seeing today. Uh, the other thing I think that's important to, to note is that um, when it, what's making the thing even worse is that health workers are being contaminated or are being exposed, which means they are no longer able, to, either they're sick and they've died, or they're no longer able to work in the hospital because they're kept aside. Now, if you had a situation like the one I described in Amsterdam where maybe 10 healthcare workers were exposed to an Ebola patient, I mean, I don't know how many people work at AMC, but it would be a drop in the bucket. But currently in Senegal, for example, there's one case uh, and, and the guy actually didn't fit any of the case definitions. He's getting better. But 40 healthcare workers have been taken out. That's a huge amount of people for a country like Senegal. So this is another thing, is that Ebola strikes the very structures that are meant to contain it, which are health, health systems. So this is really the crux of the story, that in a way this was inevitably going to happen somewhere in Africa because We've just uh, gutted health systems, and they're no longer able to cope. But do you have the impression that the media have covered this story, which are telling now, or not? not uh, I mean, I've seen there have been some good, uh, longer articles in the New York Times and uh, in uh, Le Monde, and so on. But I, I think that uh, it needs to be. It'll, it'll come out more. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe for the perspective, it's interesting to uh, uh, remember that uh, the Dutch government spent uh, almost 400 million on vaccinations for the Mexican flu in 2009. Uh, they were all thrown away. And, uh, well, this, this was the you, you, time you, you flew. You this could was read right. in the newspaper today that the World Health Organization says that we need 400 million to uh, solve this crisis now in, uh, in West Africa. So 
that, that gives a sort of perspective on, on the problem and how it is dealt with. Is this an easy money question then, Mr. Krobisch, or, or not? Uh, well, <coughs> no, definitely not. What you need is, well, it is a question of money, because yeah. money facilitates improving <laughs> healthcare structures. It facilitates investing in um, uh, moving on, pushing on with developing drugs and vaccines, which will be too late to contain this outbreak anyway, but which will help in the future or be of use if the situation gets so much out of control that the epidemic turns into a level of endemicity, where at any point in time we do have a number of cases which uh, um, occur. Uh, steadily. So the, you, re you mean that the virus remains in humans, not just in the beds? No, 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 no. That's not, no. I mean that at present we are still talking about an outbreak, yeah, of an unprecedented scale, yeah. but it's still an outbreak, mm -hmm. yeah. So this we call an epidemic of something, whereas the virus has not taken root in this area, at least not amongst people so far. Now, um, what I mean with an endemicity is that the disease becomes, let's say, uh, will be encountered on a daily basis, maybe not on that scale, but uh, as an important differential diagnosis to any fever of the next couple of years. So in such a situation, well, investments which are made now may then help to control it better. But what is now needed is a concerted effort of money, of course, but also of people. And that is very, very difficult to haul the infrastructure which is needed into um, these countries. I don't know how many of you are familiar with working conditions and living conditions in those countries. Liberia, for example, has been wrecked through civil strife since 30 years. Even without Ebola, um, you would not wish to be depending on the health system there. No, the, neither do the people, actually. And to rectify all this just um, um, uh, at present will be, um, even, even if we quadruple the, if the amount of money um, it will be very, very difficult, actually. How do we know whether the virus has become endemic? I mean, the statistics, we, we don't even know, I guess, how many cases there are right now, isn't it, Mr. Nguyen? Well, we know if it becomes endemic if we are confronted with new cases on a permanent scale. Yeah. This is uh, what we call an... Uh, in, in level of endemicity, such yeah. as malaria, etc. So if it becomes, let's say, if it's not possible to contain this outbreak within a couple of months, and we do have doubts because it goes on since very, very long, actually, then we have precisely that situation. Well, right now there are these predictions that at least 20,000 people will be, uh, will be a case in, before, before the end of this year. Yeah. Maybe uh, you look like so, you've so doubt I with it. I think um, one way to think about epidemic versus endemic is in an epidemic, the number of new cases is increasing. The rate is increasing. It's going up, whereas it stays stable in an endemic situation. And you, when there's no endemic, you have no new cases. Um, the, the numbers are very difficult to uh, judge because, as we mentioned earlier, it's, it, we're very certain that we're under diagnosing and underestimating cases. And the predictions are based on sophisticated mathematical models that rely on existing cases. But most people who are knowledgeable, in fact, I think all people, are expecting at least 300,000 cases by Christmas. Uh, and the question is, the, the epidemic is now uh, out of control. So 300,000. That, Around 200. That's like 10 times more than the current WHO yes. predictions. Yeah, more than 10 so times. So on what do you base that number? Well, this is based on the latest mathematical models uh, done by, and now I forget who. Do you remember? Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, we... You're skeptical. <laughs> I, I like drama, you know, so... <laughs> well, no, well, the point is actually... Um, um, uh, there, there is a, there sits a big difficulty in this predicting how it develops further because we know so little about the facts which we use as a basis for these calculations. So, uh, I remember very well the calculations uh, at the beginning of the HIV pandemic when 
let's say, the steep delta in the beginning of the epidemic, where more and more people got infected, led to predictions that we would not have been congregating here today because most of you would not have even been born to, due to the spread of the HIV pandemic. Now, the, the prediction models, they, most of these models who, who, who predict that it, um, it, it becomes exponential, actually, as it is, they do not seem to factor in the possibility of, um, let's say, a more effective level of control. So I'm not really sure if you extrapolate the figures which we now have, if you calculate with a high number of uh, unknown cases, which is probably the case, then you arrive at scenarios like those. What it doesn't take into account is, do we have in two, three months from now uh, a higher number of, let's say, monoclonal antibodies, which may help treating the patients. Um, will there be a better control of uh, new transmission through to the arrival of thousands of helpers from overseas who set up ad hoc hospitals, etc.? So, I, in my view, it, it makes it extremely difficult to to juggle these figures. Yeah. And what? modeling in infectious diseases, we always have to. Um, yeah, many of our colleagues work with modeling, but we see from, from all predictions for infectious diseases how difficult, yeah, how it, difficult is. It, it is. It really yeah. is. We, all I would like to say is we must not mistake models for um, uh, a truth of any yeah. kind. Yeah, so we, I, I would say, I would be very open and I would like to say we really don't know where this yeah. is heading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Festermann, may I ask you, what, what is the, um, the value of all these numerical comparison with other diseases, the number of deaths in a few months? What, what happens to the audience, to the publics, when they hear these numbers? Um, what can we learn from yeah, them? Uh, as I said, uh, the media uh, don't just report facts. They gave meaning to the facts. Eh? They, they put the facts in a perspective. And that's also the same for, uh, for uh, diseases and for... Uh, uh, epidemics uh, in other, other uh, continents and uh, you have to remember that uh, the media select news according to news values. Eh? Is it extreme? Is it negative? Is it uh, relevant to us? Is it meaningful to us? Etc. That's one perspective they use. The other perspective they use is could it be a threat for us in the developed world in the long term or in the short term? That's another perspective, perspective that is very dominant. And also a crisis situation has much more news value than a situation that becomes endemic. As, as soon as this whole epidemic becomes endemic, then the media will lose their, their attention for, for Ebola, I think. So if you, if you look at these news values and the frames they use, then you will see that the media coverage is very, uh, let's say, selective. Uh, they, 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 they focus on, on specific diseases and epidemics and they, uh, let's say, they lose interest in all kinds of other diseases. Uh, let's say malaria or uh, all kinds of diseases that are very common in uh, African countries are considered as a sort of fact of life and not as newsworthy because they don't refer to news values they are not extreme, they, are not, uh, they don't have a horror factor. And that's, that's looking at Ebola, that's a very important factor. For the media, it is a very horrendous disease, of course, with a, a very high horror yeah. factor. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll expand on that in a few people minutes. People dying, uh, people, uh, the, the, the health uh, care workers uh, with yeah. their uh, yellow Correct. suits and masks, that's very, very impressive and compelling uh, images. Mm -hmm. uh, which find the, the media find that very interesting, very yeah. attractive to uh, to pay attention to. So that these are all kinds of other factors that make something like that newsworthy compared yeah. to the real uh, risk and yeah. the real amount of people who die yeah. from this disease. And just to make that comparison, what are the numbers for malaria or tuberculosis? Um, if we make that comparison, yeah, very easy. I mean, uh, let's start with HIV. Thirty-nine million people are living with HIV/AIDS. 35 million are living with HIV AIDS. Every year, 1.5 million people die from HIV. Um, tuberculosis, every year, 8.8 .8 million new patients infected. No, not infected. 10 times as many are infected. 8.89 .8, million people are falling ill, of which 1.3 
succumb to the disease of which half of them are co-infected with HIV. Malaria, 500, no, maybe less, I know, 350 million, 350 million uh, people suffering from malaria or a malaria episode every year, of which still six, 700,000 die, most of them children in West Africa, actually. Yeah, so these are the comparative figures. But it's not our problem, actually, which makes it less attractive for the media. Yeah, and it's a sort of fact of life in Africa, so it's nothing new, extreme, it's not... Uh... So, yeah, because Africa isn't uh, media well, it's it, done is, our it is, but maybe in a in a in a in a in a sense which um, yeah, doesn't help to um, let's say encourage um, getting the facts. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Nguyen, I, I thought you want to say uh, expand on what well, Mr. Fassman just said. Well, I think the said. numbers are interesting because uh, a lot of those deaths, malaria, HIV, TB, are in a way invisible uh, in the sense that they become sure. part of everyday life and this is what why Ebola is so frightening um, I would just say one thing I wanted to add is if we think about the response to Ebola today uh, President Obama is sending in the army he announced that Tuesday um, they're not going to have the first field hospitals up and running until uh, probably the beginning of October uh, they want to train, the Americans are planning to train 500 healthcare workers a week. Uh, that's a lot of people. There, there were, until uh, four died, there were 51 doctors in all of Liberia. And I can tell you, as somebody who's trying to get together, uh, find people to go, nobody wants to go. People are afraid, uh, as they should be, of healthcare workers. So I'm not optimistic that the response is going to be much better for a, quite a long time. So what is being done right now, actually? People are being treated, but, but how, and does it help? Well, the only, the people, are be, people who come for care are, are being turned away in some places in Liberia. The treatment centers are full, and the only thing that you can do is uh, give people fluids and uh, antibiotics, but even that is not being done because it's too dangerous to uh, uh, put in the catheters. So yeah. it's very So is, is there any indication that this helps, or are we just all waiting for a vaccine? I don't think we know. What? what well, to what extent does supportive care well, decrease uh, mortality? Well, I would, I would be very blunt on this. I think at the very moment, I mean, we could return the question. Let's say you get infected with Ebola. Would you stay in Liberia or would you take advantage of the possibility to be airlifted out? You would probably go for the second opinion. Why? Not only because your friends and families are here, but because our level of care is much better. And I do believe, I do really believe that supportive care makes a difference, actually. Mm -hmm. If you do get your differential diagnosis sorted out, if there is support of your renal function, if you get adequate fluids, in the case of a co-infection with uh, a bacterium which takes advantage of your infected body, then your uh, survival chances go drastically up, actually. I mean, um, and they are, they, I mean, 50, 60 percent under the worst conditions are surviving, yeah? But mm -hmm. this goes drastically up oh, right. in the very moment um, right. that you have good basic care. So the other question is then, does this help to stop the spread? And for that, we want to hold a little debate, and I have the statement, given the severity of the outbreak and at the service of the public health, we must dare to consider drastic measures, such as a lengthy total lockdown of cities like Monrovia, the capital of Liberia, where it's currently quite bad. So, Mr. Nguyen, I think there is a way to defend this statement. So, uh, that there was an attempt to quarantine a slum of Monrovia, uh, which backfired because uh, people tried to get out and were shot, and it led to tremendous mistrust of the authorities. Um, what, I can't, what I'll say provocatively, I don't believe this personally, but the, the, the classic approach to containing epidemics through history has always been to isolate, to quarantine, and to stop transmission between groups of people. 
I think you could ask yourself the question. So, so, so in Sierra Leone, uh, one approach has been to keep everybody at home for three days so that teams can go from house to house and identify cases. Uh, that is a standard public health approach. It doesn't sit comfortably with our belief in human rights and we could worry about um, what this will do in terms of trust because so trust is very important. So why is it important. not in, in comfort with human rights? What's well, you can't force people, I mean, you, you, it's not respectful of people's human rights to force them to, you know, to stay at home. Um, I mean, we've all seen the movies, you know, I mean, with, you know, guns and soldiers and so on and so forth. So, uh, but I, I think, you know, if there isn't a viable health care system, there's a case to be made for this kind of approach. But there's a lot of ifs. Uh, and the main one being that, unlike here, people don't have anything in the fridge. In fact, they don't have fridges. So what are they going to eat for three days? You know, I mean, this is really the basic. So then you need food droppings and send in water and then lock it down and, and then what? If one could do that, maybe that would be something that could be explored. Or I mean, I, in general, one could ask whether care needs to move out from hospitals and into the community, for example. But I don't know. I mean, I think these are questions we can ask ourselves. You're saying that classically, like, uh, in the old days, this happened even before well? there were governments, really. I mean, um, it's always been an approach that's been used by communities to isolate them, you know, in, in times of plague. Uh, but also, uh, quarantine was used in Roman times. It's been used in various other uh, situations. So, We've but done it's it been done for much more, mu much more contagious yeah. diseases that are much more contagious. Yeah. That's important. We, we have done that in the Netherlands, of course, as well with tuberculosis, etc. But usually, you try to you try to strike a balance, actually, and you would not, uh, let's say, treat patients like prison inmates, but you would convey your message very strongly, and this is what all societies have done. But on this scale, actually, one has doubts that it would work. Yeah, it starts with simple things, like you cannot cut off whole yeah. parts of a city uh, without catering for basic needs such as water and things. So probably it's very, very, it's, it's impossible. Yeah. I would say it's impossible. Yeah. You cannot do that. Do you think that the, the social, Mr. Fasterman, do you think that the social dynamic in these countries right now is such that it, it's helpful for stopping the spread of the disease or um, are there fears that uh, are um, not productive for the contagion of this disease? Well, what do you mean by social dynamics in, in these countries? So like I heard a story that people are afraid of the doctors. Do you recognize that or, or yeah, what could be done as about it? As I said, that? there's a lot of uh, ignorance and a lot of superstition and rumors. And if you have lack of trust, and that's the same in Holland, actually. If people do not trust the government or do not trust the hospitals, then you get a very uh, tricky situation where they uh, do not accept uh, care from the, from the hospitals, etc. And it, 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 it's, it's not exclusive for those countries. The same thing we saw happening also in Holland. Uh, we did a study about uh, the, uh, the Belmont disaster uh, where uh, people were convinced that they had uh, a disease as a consequence of the toxic load of the plane. That's a short summary of a very long story. Uh, but but they, 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 they cling to that. They, 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 they stuck to that story for years and for years and never believed uh, the people from the AMC who said, well, there is no, there is no link between the air crash, the crashing plane and the disease that you have. And this took years and years and even led to a parliamentary uh, inquiry in 1999. They, you see that, that lack of trust and, and superstition and rumors and uh, how do you call that, uh, conspiracy theories uh, can also happen in Holland. That's not something exclusive for African countries. If I may add something small, actually, there is also a grain of truth in it, because if you look at the early epidemics, they all spread through hospitals, actually. Okay. It were nosocomial uh, disease. The first outbreak in Gulu in 1976, there was one 
one person who brought the disease from the rainforest to a mission hospital and all the others, and that has been proven and shown, all the others were infected through the needles which the nurses used on those patients in order to try to help. This was in the times before there were disposable needles, actually, and the disease was transmitted from the index case to others. And the same thing happened in other outbreaks. And if you now look how it evolves, it is basically in the vicinity of doctors where the disease seemed to spread. So there is even a basis of uh, yeah, yeah. rational thinking behind it if people um, uh, and you, you have the examples of vaccinations yeah. going bad and making people ill. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. just the fact that most of the people who go to hospitals die. So, you know, where's cause yeah. and effect? Exactly. But I think there's something, we, you know, there is something new I wanted to mention earlier that we have new tools to track epidemics. And this is molecular epidemiology, where analysis of the viral uh, genome allows us to generate what we call phylogenies or family trees. And then we can then use that to figure out which cases are related to each other epidemiologically. And this is a really new tool that we have, and it, it's allowed us to uh, very quickly, in the space of a few months, uh, recreate this original epidemic. And I, I have to say that there, one of the, one of the uh, important outbreaks occurred at the funeral of a traditional healer who was caring for patients. And, and this just shows that you have to understand that when health systems don't work, people seek out care wherever they can. So this is another kind of thing we have to be aware of. Well, then you can, you, can, you can understand where transmission is happening, right? So this has been done for HIV, for tuberculosis, and you can actually, uh, if you combine it with social science, you can actually get a very interesting picture of where the outbreaks are occurring and then what, what the kind of context is that favors outbreaks. I think we have a question, so let's do that first before we go on to some discussion about the media and the reaction. Yes, thank you. So um, in, on September 11th, there was an article in the New York Times by Michael Osterholm, who is the director of the Center of Infectious Diseases Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. And he claims, the article was called What We Don't Want to Say About Ebola. And what he claims is that there are already Ebola variants which can be transmitted through the air. Uh, from pigs to monkeys and from monkeys to monkeys, which have very similar respiratory systems as we have. This seems to contradict what I've he heard earlier by uh, Dr. Grobush. So I'd like to hear your reaction on that. Yeah. No, well, I mean, if, if you look closely, then there is a lot of speculation. And what we know is that if you have a very, very close contact, actually, then it has been shown, or it can be in the lab, it, it, it can be made possible that virus is transmitted from a monkey to a monkey, yeah, also through an aerosol. But then you really have to have a very, very close contact. For man to man, so far, there is no, no proof that is the case. And what stands against it, what stands against it, is a very simple, simple thing, which is the size of the virus, actually, which makes it less likely that it becomes, becomes um, uh, transmittable by an aerosol than one of the classic um, uh, viruses, which are uh, transmitted through an aerosol, which are um, uh, influenza viruses, MERS, SARS, etc. Yeah? That there are mutations that we have established already. These viruses mutate at very, very large frequencies. This is the basic survival principle of mutation. They adapt very readily to their environment. Usually, they, they don't drastically change their um, biology. There are very few examples, if any, I couldn't think of any, I must say, personally, which doesn't mean there is none, where uh, some basic characteristics of a virus, such as the way how it's transmitted, altered. Yeah. Possible is everything, but also HIV did never become, and uh, this is mutating, it's the pool uh, of viruses is much, much greater. So even a virus which is smaller, such as HIV, never 
um, uh, never did that actually and um, I think there is still a lot of speculation but of course we need to speculate about those things and there are unusual features in this outbreak which is that it is perpetually perpetually um, moving onwards. So the question comes naturally, yes, but uh, the evidence is not, uh, if you read the article very careful, then there is no hard evidence, yeah, and we don't know. Well, uh, I think it's all very surprising that a story like that gets into the media because the journalists always have a sort of uh, tendency to give uh, attention to experts with extreme standpoints because they are very, they are very much more attractive for the media than the experts who have a very balanced view on, on an outbreak like this. And uh, well, the media ha prefer the worst case scenario people who, uh, who, can, who can establish the worst case scenario. So that doesn't surprise me, but well, you have to look at the facts, of course. And uh, Yeah. 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 How, how well, the, 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 the outbreak in 1995 was uh, also at the same period where the movie Outbreak was released, uh, a movie about a, well, a sort of Ebola outbreak in Africa, which gets to, to the United States with Dustin Hoffman in a leading role there. A, a very, well, it was a very popular f movie, and what happened during that time was that the news media, news programs, used footage from that film, from that movie, in their uh, stories, in their reports on, on Ebola in uh, Zaire, in Congo. Um, this was combined with a sort of perspective that this might develop into a, de into a pandemic, and this is something that virologists have been warning for, for many years, that, well, a new pandemic will come. We don't know when, but they, it will come. And this was placed in that perspective, that this might be the next pandemic. And the same happened during uh, the, the Mexican flu outbreak in 2009, which was also introduced in the media as maybe the next pandemic. And a few weeks later, the, the, the World Health Organization uh, actually declared that it was a pandemic. But not the pandemic that was predicted, but a normal pandemic. Well, it's very confusing for the media, of course. Uh, well, we all have seen that the Mexican flu was not that, uh, that dangerous at this, as it seemed to be in the beginning. So at this point, the media are, for, are, are much more critical mm -hmm. towards claims okay. like the one in the New York Times. They that had it two times the wrong, and now maybe they're, they're two times they were wrong, and now maybe they're... Uh, they don't dare anymore to use well, this metaphor. Well, they are much more critical because they, the, 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 the general impression in the media about the Mexican flu is that it was a completely false alarm, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, cost, uh, well, yeah. half a billion well, uh, euros in, in, in Do you the think that only? a media hype can also help as a catalyst for action? Like to gain money or action. Yeah, to that's, get that's people it's a very good instrument. Yeah, it's, it, it's, mm. it's the question whether or not it's uh, in line with the facts, but it's a very good instrument to get, uh, uh, if you have media attention for something, you also get much more funding. Uh, well, there are uh, figures available uh, showing that the amount of media coverage of cancer uh, and the amount of media coverage for other diseases is perfectly in line with the money that's going to cancer and not going to the other diseases. Uh, so it's a very good instrument to get more uh, money, to get more uh, attention from the, from the politicians uh, to address this problem. Yeah, it's a very good instrument. Could you, could you, give, uh, could you give us an advice when we read the papers? What, uh, how, how do if, if they are, if they are taking one side and they are uh, not doing uh, this how, how do you read the papers? Well, I, I think it's more balanced than 20 years ago because there's lot, there is a lot more information now available uh, about uh, what is going on there. We've also seen reports from uh, from these countries, especially in the NSA Handelsblad, Volkskrant. They have correspondents over there who cover there on the ground what is happening there. So that's very good coverage. At the same time, you see, well, big headlines. You see uh, that this whole uh, way of approaching this 
this outbreaks uh, refers to this to this pandemic uh, panic. I would say. Well, I, I just heard how the Telegraph um, uh, managed to make uh, the two doctors who ha who are now in sort of isolation in their own homes because they may be contaminated with uh, Ebola. And the Telegraph made this into a very big headline about Ebola is coming to Holland. And that's, of course, very much a hype coverage. Yeah. May I ask a, a final question, maybe to all of you? What should we do? What is the best way of action right now? Stay home and lock your doors. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're serious with that? No. Yeah. No, I'm just being dramatic again. Yeah. You like to be dramatic. But, but what, should do, what should the world do? What's the best approach? I was going to say, I think it's. I think one of the conclusions is that we need to um, uh, advocate for long-term structural investments in, in in healthcare in developing countries. I, that's would be, I guess, my line. Well, of course, this is a very difficult question, and one would ask back, what do you mean with what, what we have to do? First of all, I think, let's start in the Netherlands. Yeah, I think it's really high time now, after so many weeks, that we really look cool-bloodedly at the whole thing, as far as the Netherlands is concerned. Yes, there is speculation, and as I said, we can all be killed by a meteor even before we finish in a minute. Uh, we don't know, actually. So there is always a risk of uh, this becoming a monster virus and be jumping from man to man whilst we are sitting here. There is no evidence for that. And with regard to the Netherlands, we should really become, as I said, cool-blooded and say, right, there may be cases who come to our doorsteps, and if so, we'll probably be most likely be able to identify them early and to curb spread. Yes, but with regard to Africa, this is a more pressing question. What can we do as individuals? It's, it's fairly little, actually. Um, I think uh, that can only go up the financial direction, but I think we already make a huge difference if we start don't looking in the mirror all the time and think, oh my God, um, uh, can I be infected? No, the answer is no, but I think it would be worthwhile to think more about is there anything we can do to help overcoming those problems in Africa? And they are more profound. Ebola is a symptom, actually. Mm -hmm. The diseases are others. Well, I can refer to the media. I think they have to keep going on reporting on Ebola because there is a chance that when this Ebola epidemic uh, well, goes on for a very long time, the media will lose interest in the whole story because after a while we know the pictures of the people in the yellow uh, suits and the masks, etc. We, we hear the same story over and over again of people dying there and then it's not news anymore. And I hope that the media will still keep on reporting in a balanced way on, uh, on the outbreak. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Fosterman, Mr. Kopisch, Mr. Nguyen, thank you very much for your time. Okay. This was the first battle break of this year. Next month, Wednesday, October 15th, we will talk about the weather. And that's very interesting, I tell you. Computational, psychological. So next month, I'll see you again. Thanks very much. Das wird besser kommt, wie wir zu bestellen, dass wir neu